Welcome back, wannabes and creators, to a very special presentation. Uh, I am, as many of you know, I had WannaCon last weekend, and I uh, have the ability to have uh, this wonderful streaming setup for a couple more weeks and test it out. So I decided that I'm going to try streaming a couple of our interviews live. And today we have Mark, whose last name I should have asked before he we went on stage, and how to pronounce it, because I know it's not Rikers. It's not Rikers, right? You were close. It's Rickers. It rhymes Rickers. with Snickers. Uh, as, as my my grandmother who taught like grade school used to say. I love it. I say uh, it's like Nol it's Nolte, like Nick Nolte, but spelled differently. So <laughs> nice. Oh, that's a good one. Yes. Uh, well, it's getting worse because you know Nick Nolte is quite old now, so it works for new for people like our age, but not for younger people. They don't understand. Uh, <laughs> like who? So that that joke is is aging out. We need a new Nolte that's like famous so that I can use them. Uh, so, uh, Mark, uh, we met at uh, podcast uh, podcast evolutions a couple of months uh, last month. God, it feels like forever yeah, ago. It really uh, does. Like one of the last conventions that might ever exist for the rest of our lives. The last time yeah. now. It was uh, the, the definitive podcast movement. Now. The definitive podcast yeah. movement. They, I think uh, they just canceled the, the main one. No yeah. One they're saying, or they're like, oh, we're not sure if this is going to happen. Well, if it's not going to happen in August, it's really tough to uh, it's really tough to, uh, to to imagine it happen to anything happening in August because that's like the last bastion of all these cons that are canceling now or kind of rescheduling to August. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I have stuff I go to in September, and that's I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Although, like, there's so many things happening, like me not being able to go to my internet conference is not really that big a deal. Right. Well, um, and I have San Diego Comic Con, which oh wow, yeah, which like this in July, and uh, you know, I make a. Uh, 20 to 40 percent of my income every year from shows so uh uh i'm i'm kind of freaking out and trying not to freak out and trying to go on i'm trying we're launching this big product right now and every day i do it i'm caught between like people need something to focus on like that's not this big thing and also like who cares about my like little book right now that's like the world is coming down and i'm trying to tell people to go and buy my little book uh but um so I'm like that literally like hour by hour, feel like a cat batting a toy back and forth. These, so, uh, I'm, so I'm a public radio producer and I just got out of a staff meeting where we were actually talking about this exact same, this exact thing, which is like, on the one hand, we feel like we all have a lot of time and we have an audience that really, really, really wants to connect with something. Some, you know, it's clear, like we have people writing in who are like, just post as many interviews about animals and, and things that are not related to what's happening so I can escape. And then there's people who are like, I want to hear your take on this. And it's like this incredible creative opportunity, but also a ton of pressure. And we're not hundred percent. We're not all pulling in the same direction quite yet. Yeah. I, I don't so. know how you, cause on one hand, I look at my podcast app feed now and I'm, I say, Oh my God, like there's a lot of things about coronavirus and I just, I, I will go to whatever one, that like is not about coronavirus, but then I'll open my podcast app like 20 minutes later and be after that interview and be like, no, I have to know everything that's happening right now. Yeah. Uh, so no, it's especially, crazy. Especially since like the daily podcast has really taken off, like literally the daily, but also just the format, the daily podcast, right. like that feeling of like, oh, we need to put something out right now that really addresses right now. Like there's that pressure has never felt more intense you know and it's i think anybody who who creates stuff on the internet can relate right i mean it's like now in this moment where more people are than ever are on the internet more often like they're all just that's basically where we're all living right now like oh so i need, I need to be as present there as i possibly can be like the 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 possibility of burnout for people in creative fields has probably never been higher yeah well it's tough because on one hand, uh, I really appreciated. I, I really appreciate the weekly format because it gives you time to like breathe and like compose yourself and like and 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 and, and decide the relevancy of a, an idea and like really think about what you have to put out. I mean, I think that's that's the thing that I miss about the. I'm not quite old enough to remember the pre-internet days but i remember the the young internet days when like people were measured about the statements they made 
Mm-hmm. And I, 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 I miss those days. Uh, but on the same time, I yearn for the like immediacy of what's happening this minute. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, like, I don't know how to like parse that because I feel like everybody is going through that same thing. It's like, I want to, I want to disconnect and just take a walk and not think about all this stuff that's happening. But at the same time, I need to know everything that's happening because it's happening in such a rapid pace. Yeah. Well, it's, I think one of the nice things about podcasting is you can kind of, you're giving, you're putting that choice in the hand of your listeners. Like, as long as you put out something that you're proud of, like, you know, they can listen to it on while they're walking their dog. And then if later they just decide, you know what, halfway through this walk, I'm just going to listen to music or I'm just going to listen to my dumb video game podcast because I just, I've taken in as much as I possibly can. Like they can pause your show. They can come back to it when they feel like they're ready to listen to it. You know, there's, there's a little bit more of a permanent, I mean, there's a reason why like everyone is just opening up streaming binging right now. Right. They're just like anything that's like on the shelf that they can kind of consume in mass just because like, Ooh, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Sorry. My screen went to sleep. I was like, everything went black for a second. I was like, Oh God. That is um, the my that is the fear that at some point I'm just gonna be looking at my computer and it's just gonna go black and I'm gonna be like, it's gonna be like, wow, <laughs> this really is like the end of it all. Huh? Yeah, I was I was half expecting like there to be like the uh, the purge alarm. You know, it's like, oh god, it's happening. I mean, I saw it in your face. It was like they had that the eyes went black. And I was like, oh, no, nice. no, 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 yeah, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> So aside from this, let's talk about what you're passionate about these days. And uh, let's 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 we talked about the the world burning down. Let's uh, let's bring it back down to like what you're passionate about and what your creative what gets your creative juices flowing. Sure. So um, like in the context of work or just generally, generally, whatever you want to do. I usually try and keep it to to uh, to business stuff or work stuff. But I've had people talk about like uh puzzles and like knitting and uh and political things and other stuff the only one i've cut out is the political one because i felt like uh that one is a little bit too close to like people's pain centers yeah Eh, that's you know it depends on the context but yeah um you know i'm always and you know like we so we're like a weekly news magazine show so everyone kind of has a different topic area of interest um mine tends to be you know, like to call it technology, I feel like the best technology journalists right now are really culture journalists who talk about online culture. Like they don't, no one's writing stories about like, well, I mean, I know reporters who are writing stories about like 5G internet and stuff like that. But like when I think about internet journalism, that's not really, like I think about reporters who are like looking at how communities are forming on Reddit or, you know, like th- there was some trend piece about, I think the headline was just, we all live in Zoom now. And just just about like, oh, well, like you have like this now critical mass of people who are just hanging out in video chats because they need they need that connection right now. Mm -hmm. So I think like just thinking about different ways that people use technology to kind of mediate connection, if that makes sense. It's like a really technocratic way of saying social media, because I like social media has always fascinated me, but not really like partially because of the creative possibilities, but also just because it's a social space. And Mm -hmm. we we tend to talk about, like we talk about Facebook, like it's a company and it is, but you know, like a place like that. I mean, I think it's, you you put it in in starker terms of like, you know, it's really like the world's largest country, you know, like it it has the most people of anywhere on the planet. They just Mm -hmm. are all there in this online space. Um, so I've tried to do, I, I think I've produced a few shows about this subject and and like it can kind of touch in different corners of the world in ways you might not expect. Like um, I did a whole show about, originally it was pitched as uh, like, do we need, do we even need movie theaters anymore? Like, are they just an artifact of this time when like it was a constraint of like, you had to go to this physical place to watch a movie together. And so then I think that kind of the takeaway from that show is that there are certain experiences that are just like the online thing, the online piece of it is not equivalent and we're not, it's, it's just not the same. And so, but that doesn't mean that both spaces don't have value. So like thinking about ways to expand, like how we can kind of experience culture in online spaces and like 
interact not only interact with each other but you know like create new norms and like like the emergence of memes or like like lately the thing for me is like i find tiktok fascinating like it's i think it really took like diving in and understanding that it's essentially just a giant meme factory um in terms of like like i don't know how familiar you are with it at all but uh, i i i feel like it's like it's like Snapchat, but the next evolution of Snapchat, kind of. It's like videos so, and stuff, or is it different? Because so different. no, I'm gonna say no. Yeah, so it's it's different. It's it's so it's this collision of a bunch of different things, right? It's there was an app called Musically, which was uh, essentially like a like a karaoke app, kind of like you would um, play. This is gonna be like two oldish white guys talking about the high school kid app. Okay, so it'll be fun. No, uh, but but Musically. Um, was people essentially doing karaoke on video and then it kind of evolved into them doing dances. So, so there's this component of like putting on something and then performing to it and making a short video piece about that. And then that kind of collided with Vine, which was these like six second comedy videos. And so then they kind of brought all that technology together and what it's become is like, you know, you might uh, have a video clip of like a new, like the, you know, like from a YouTube video, even like just like a like a single meme moment. And then you might have like you and I film a little skit where we perform parts from that video in a different context. So there's like it's kind of like all the best parts about like weird niche Internet culture. So it's like, you know, there's dog Internet because like there's dog Instagram and like influence inf pet influencers and stuff like that. So now you have like pet influencers acting out skits from YouTubers on TikTok. So it's this like weird, like kind of rock tumbler internet meme machine that just is so strange. And and like, it's it's all built around creation. It's all built around this idea of like, we're gonna lower the barrier of entry for you to create something not 100% new, but it, it has that early internet feel of like the remix culture mm -hmm. aspect of things. And like, oh, everything should be free. Everything should flow. You can kind of turn something here's three things you can combine them and make something new on your own. Like it's, it's like that in it's Ross purest form. Um, that does sound a lot better than what I've seen of TikTok. I mean, yeah. I've seen the things that come out of it, like old town road and the, the, uh, the, the surprise mother effer uh, thing <laughs> from a couple of years ago. But yeah. uh, uh, that's a lot different than the, than the perception that I had of, uh, of uh, Snapchat. I still, I was, TikTok. I still think I'm like I'm past the years where like I could in endure that, but uh, I can see I can see how that is significantly different than a lot of the other uh, um, social media platforms that are out there. Yeah, I mean it's I think it's underscored to me like probably maybe it's just because I'm getting older, or maybe it's just the way that I've my relationship to media. But like it made me realize how much media I just consume and don't really like. I really feel like. In a certain point, if you use this app and you create TikToks on a regular basis, everything you're viewing, you're thinking about in the context of like, how can I use this to create something new that speaks to my experience? And it's like this goofy video that's like originally like somebody, yet like a live stream of The Sims that just ends with a joke about a dog doing something weird. Like that can become something that's about your life. And like you're thinking, you're processing everything through the lens of creating something, which you know, like I can't say that I do for a lot of the other media I consume. So like, it's kind of cool. It, it, it feels like it's setting up a, like a healthier relationship to media for the people who are using it. Um, I do worry that like, you know, it is easy to just kind of scroll infinite scroll. It's the same problem that every social media app has, but it, but it is, it does feel different for some reason. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. I mean, I feel like I, that's how I see the world. I view the world as a creative human who like makes books and stuff. It's always like pulling from this source and pulling from this source and pulling from this source and pulling from that source and saying, well, there's nothing new. But if I if I take 10 sources and smash them all together, I can like create at least my take on how there's this is what I think of this kind of world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think like that notion of like combining a ton of different influences and and kind of you using it to as like you know it, it's it's like you know traditionally you'd think of like in write as a writer like you think about like your arsenal like you you read as many books as you possibly can so you're literate in like all the different 
ways of writing all the different tropes and so like it feels like we're creating these spaces where like you have to be literate in video audio text social media all of these things all at once and then they're all this rich palette you can draw from to create something new um well, that's wonderful yeah. i mean yeah my favorite memes are the ones that you're like you have to go down you have to understand 10 different things to get this meme and i love it so much that like it has to be so niche but then you realize no it's not that niche because like it got shared like a hundred thousand times so like, there's a right. hundred thousand people at least that have that uh that sense of the, that like combined amount of data points which is right. kind of awesome yeah no it's like you you think about like critical scholars who thought about this idea of like intertextuality and like books speaking to one another and like you show them some of the stuff that we're consuming now it's like literally every part of the cultural ecosystem could be colliding at any possible moment yeah and absolutely it's, it's just a bananas i mean it's a bananas world for a lot of reasons but yeah well, I love uh, I love the thing you were talking about about like social like, about like connections online because we live in a we're 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 uh, we're recording this in like in the first real week of like most places being locked down and sending people out and like it kind of started last week in Seattle in a couple of cities but like most of the big cities that I know uh, uh, are like kind of starting this shutdown at least in like the the major cities uh, on the coast maybe some cities in the middle actually is really weird uh because i was listening to the weeds this morning and they were like you don't seem to under like most people don't understand that there's like there are people that are dealing with this on a daily basis in the cities and then there are people in like spring break that like have a very different idea of what this whole thing is. And like in smaller towns where like, it's not hitting them. And mm -hmm. so it doesn't seem real. And I, uh, I find that idea fascinating that like, we're having like almost two different experiences of this, uh, this virus and this time in, in world history. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a weird moment. You know, like I, we're all, I'm sorry. I just lost my train of thought. It's okay. Yeah. It's hard. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to express it in words. Like what? Yeah. Uh, Cause I, I'm, I try to keep this show not about that stuff and my marketing, not about that stuff, but sometimes it has no choice, but to seep in like that's, it's like, so, um, but I, I love that this idea that online spaces and like how do we make online spaces more uh more connection oriented like you would go out to a bar and see your friends even if uh it's it's just on even if it's online i know i was i listened to seth godin's podcast akimbo and he for the whole month is setting up these like virtual workspaces on zoom where people can just go in and uh and work and not talk and just like work together. I know my wife, uh, my wife's office is doing the same thing uh, where like a lot of their teams just are like on conference calls all day together. Uh, and then like in case they need each other, uh, yeah. which is sort of we like we're, we're growing into this like world uh, where like all uh, where you're smashing, um, like you're, you're smashing into, um, uh, uh, the online world and the real life world, like at a speed that may have taken 10 years to do. And we're doing it all in like three days. Yeah, totally. Like you, you definitely like the, <laughs> but there are all kinds of, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of great stories of people in kind of like intergenerational workspaces places or like work big workplaces where maybe part of the workforce was working online before but not all of them and now all of a sudden everybody is forced into that same context that there's just like like today we were on uh, an all staff call and i think somebody just hit the mass unmute button and just unmuted every single person on the conference call that was like 200 people and it was just this chaotic moment where all of a sudden you were just getting streams of every single person's like home office setup and like it was actually kind of beautiful in, in a weird way um because we all it did feel like we were all in the same place but you did realize just like how chaotic that is and how like a controlled technologically like we can use technology to kind of like 
artificially focus, you know, like it's just the two of us, you know, that's, it's ignoring, you know, like anybody who might be watching this or like anyone else in your house or mine, but like, it's, I don't know. It's, it's like, we're trying to like recreate physical spaces in this moment because it's like, okay, that's the, that's the closest thing we have to a middle ground. Yeah. Well, we saw, I, I've been looking have you seen Netflix party yet? No. So Netflix party is this site where you, you and your friends can, it's uh, I think it's an extension for Chrome, maybe oh, probably other platforms too. And, yeah. uh, you can basically have a, like watch the same thing together and have like a video stream and, but it's all you're on it together and you're all doing like the same chat and watching the thing at the same time. And That's I cool. mean, humans are social creatures. Like we, we are, we are, we're, but we're also very adaptable. So like if all the movie theaters are going to go down, I love that somebody like the next day is like, well, uh, maybe I create a thing where we can all watch Netflix together all over the country then. Right. Yeah. No. And like, but it's also like totally logical, right? Because like the whole argument is that if you, if you are going to go to the movie theater, the only reason you're going is so you can watch it with other people. So as soon as that gets taken away, it's like, oh, well, and that's, I think like, technology at its most beautiful is in moments like that where someone's just like well if i took this thing and combined it with this thing like i can solve this problem that actually exists like it's not just creating stuff for the sake of anything it's like oh i'm solving a problem that is like you know either helping people consume culture in a way that that is more constructive for them or or like create things together or like i think um the other thing i have always thought were really interesting are those um like people who paint or draw who then stream basically sometimes it's digital sometimes they just have a camera but it's like basically like just letting people watch their process like i just think that's really interesting like as somebody who like if i like just streamed uh like a google doc of me writing that would make me so so anxious uh well i've tried doing that before yeah. so uh you know, I'm, I'm trying to find ways to do this live stream, uh, like this interview and, and, uh, and as many ways as I can. And one of those ways I've been, I've tried it before was, uh, to like live stream a writing event. And like, it just is not the same because mm -hmm. like you need so much focus that it just ends up be me being me with my tongue partially out, like doing, like looking angry. And then you're just watching words flow, flow by. And then I'm, I feel like I have to comment on it, which like breaks the flow. And, and then I'm like, you have to expand, you know, the, the, you have to make it like 200% or 300%. So anybody can see it. So now the words are way bigger than I like want them to be. And it's just, it's a very uh, jarring experience for, for me. And I don't know. I, I, I'm sure that if I if I talk to an artist, they were like, "Yeah, it's also jarring for me too." But I just I can't imagine um, uh, 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 having to think creatively and then also talk about it and then also like do it at a high level at the same time and make it interesting. Right, but that's the thing. I, I mean, it's like you tend to think about something like that in the context of consuming. So you're thinking like, "Oh, I, this needs to be like an entertaining." stream you know like there needs to be fun stuff happening for people like so it's like an entertainment show but like really what that is is more kind of like you go to the coffee shop and you see someone who's drawing something interesting and you're just kind of able to have that kind of voyeuristic like oh that's cool that they're working on that and like you could just stand there and stare at them drawing for a while and it might make them feel a little bit strange that you're just standing there staring at them but like ultimately they're they're not performing in that space they're just like, hey, if you want, you know, like I'm here, like we're here together. So, just, right. So that, well, that's, I, and that's kind of what the Zoom thing is kind of becoming, right? It's like, oh, let's just have spaces like that where we're just here together. Yeah. I, uh, I, 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 I like the idea of the Zoom thing. I feel like I can, I can get into the thing of the Zoom because like I won't feel performative. It's just like a bunch of people like working at mm -hmm. the same time but like when somebody like hi lala how are you uh we're just talking to my friend mark rickers uh podcaster and audio person and we're uh we're talking about technology and streaming and literally the thing we're doing now it's actually kind of meta oh, yeah. <laughs> uh so yeah but i i do think that the zoom meeting like feels uh less performative it just feels like hey we're all just gonna show up and and 
and hang out. But uh, I don't know, maybe maybe I should just think of it like, well, people are just going to come on and maybe there's some clacking of the keys that is very like um, soothing to people and I don't have to perform. Right. Uh, and we can just we just all want to kind of be in the same place as other people. Well, I mean, that's the thing when it's specifically to writing. I think people who don't write or maybe write not quite as often, like kind of assume that it just pours out of you. And it's just like, you know, like I could spend two days writing something that's like 500 words sometimes. And other times I'll write two or 3000 word stories in like 40 minutes, you know? So it really depends on, I wish I could explain <laughs> why, or like so many late nights working on things where I was like, why do we, why was that so hard for 12 hours? And then it was super easy, like at that specific moment. And I don't know if it's brain chemistry. I don't know if it's like divine animal spirits. Like I, it could be anything. So like being able to watch that in real time and know like, Oh, like it's okay to struggle when I'm trying to write something. Like sometimes it's just about getting started or like, yeah, it is. It does kind of feel like witchcraft sometimes or yeah. wizard, wizard craft. That's what uh, Lala is saying right now. I think people who write, it's like wizards. It's magic. Yeah. Um, I think that it's like your monkey brain or your lizard brain is like processing all this information. And sometimes it just takes hours for it to go. And then it like clicks. Yeah. Uh, I've always thought of writing kind of like uh, playing a video game. Like I remember it's probably the more I think about it, the more it might not actually have happened in a video game. But there's. I imagine like Laura Croft going into like a room in like a temple and there's all of these cog like pegs on the, on the board in front of her. And there's all these cogs underneath it. And like, she has to put like all the cogs in the right place for like the door to open and like writing or figuring this stuff out is kind of like you put the cog there and it doesn't work. And then the cog over here and it doesn't, when you slowly like build it. And then just by, by finding all of the angles, it, uh, it like finally on like clicks and unlocks something in some new way that you weren't even thinking about before. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You're just like, Oh, now it couldn't be any other way. This right. Is, it just clicked, you know, what? like it's uh, like, a, a, and also just like that things don't kind of come out fully formed. Like I will, it's, I don't, I, I can't say that I've seen too many other people write this way. Like I will write, like I'll outline, in this kind of like almost like a code, like like I'm kind of building an HTML document because I a lot of my background is in building like web pages and stuff like that too, and uh, it's like you said, you're you're kind of like grafting on. Okay, so like I have this is this is my level, and now I need to like fill it in with details, and then I might move the details around, I might move paragraphs around, but like you can kind of still see the end of the level, and, and it it just kind of keeps getting moved here and there until it finally is like, okay, this was the path that it always had to be to get from one end to the other. Right. And it looks, uh, what did Neil Gaiman say? He said, uh, second drafts are just, uh, are just, uh, going back to the first draft and making it look like you knew what you were doing all along. So that's yeah. how I feel a lot of times is uh, I just wrote this big, I did this virtual conference and I just wrote this big blog post, like 10,000 word blog post about it, like literally the whole process. And like a lot of it was, out like once I got the outline down and kind of knew where I was going, I was able to write pretty fast, but it took like two days to get all of the pieces in the right order and then move them around and then figure it out. But like once it was done, I think I got like 7,000 of the 10,000 words out in that first day. And then like the, no, I think I got all 10,000 words out in that one day, but it took three days to line all the pieces up in every block and put them in the right place. Yeah. And then ideally you're probably cutting stuff out because like sometimes the best, the, the best way to refine something is, is by subtraction. You know, I mean, like I think getting, I I've written probably way more bad stuff than good stuff. And I just subtract all, all the bad out of it. Hopefully most of the time. Yeah. I think that's a, or smashing it together. I prefer smashing things together or like, and most of the things is like, well, I already went through this here a little bit. So like, let me just take a little bit of this and then like sort of like push it into this area and expand that out. Um, I found a lot of my early writing, especially in the nonfiction space was a lot of it was uh, like I would say something at the top and then I would say the same thing in the middle and then I would say the same thing at the bottom. And like when I kind of learned like how to 
me mash all of those things together into like one place, like the writing got a lot better and more cohesive. Um, and people enjoyed it more because they wouldn't see the same thing show up throughout the article. Now they would see, or they would see it, but they would see it in like another way instead of, um, instead of the exact same way, like they would see it like, uh, synthesized into the second part, like a different part of it. So it'd be like, here's how to take this thing and then mold it into this section in here. And, uh, I don't know, I'm, I think all of the, most of the best stuff that I read is like, a, a like people just mashing a bunch of like ideas together into new and interesting ways. And I, I think that it is a lot of cutting, but it's also cutting and like pushing things together in that way that makes something great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like drawing out connections that people maybe wouldn't see. I think that's a really powerful way to, like to create something interesting, you know, it's like drawing, like th that's how you kind of get something brain expanding. You know? Yeah. I, uh, I was thinking about this as I was doing this article, because the virtual conference is pretty much just a live stream and a podcast and, uh, and an in-person conference and like taking the elements of all of that one. Once I, once Emerald city canceled and I was like, well, what do I do now? And I was like, wait, uh, my friend was using StreamYard to stream our, our podcast the other day. And like, I know how to do panels because I've been on a bunch of panels and I interview people with panels and like, I already know all these creators. And so it was like partially like taking cool parts of my network, taking displaced creators, interviewing stuff for my podcast and like all of these parts. And I was like, oh, but like, I already... I kind of already unlocked all of this stuff through like just the course of my life. And now it's just uh, 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 explaining, uh, uh, like meshing that together. And then when I started to, to decompress it after the show, it was like, well, now all I have now, what I really want to do is show people that they probably have most of the stuff that they need to do this already. And and get them motivated to do it because had I known like that I had 99% of this stuff already, I probably would have done it a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, it's actually um, I'm that specific phenomenon I'm seeing happen a lot with streaming because there's, you know, like people like they see people doing cool, interesting stuff on Twitch. Um, and they just kind of assume there's a lot of gear involved and stuff like that. And now, you know, we're all locked at home and people are like, oh, I want to do like an online concert or I want to do like a talk show or all these things. And now, you know, like the tools have never been easier to use. You probably have, if you have a computer, you probably 70% of the way there. Um, and, you know, like you can always get better gear. There's always better gear than what you're using, but, you know, you can make do with what you have. And, so uh, I think that this might be fun. This is a good segue into doing things. I think it'll be fun. Uh, we're going to talk, we should talk about gear if they want to do something like they want to do a podcast or an audio part or video. Sure. And uh, I'll give them the like down and dirty recommendation of what I do. And then okay. uh, you can give them like the, the real recommendation of like, if they wanted to sound like a, like a super professional badass. How does that sure. sound? Yeah, there's well, since yes, let's go, let's do it. All right, so um, I have a Blue Yeti microphone uh, and a pop and 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 a pop filter. Um, when I go live, I take my other laptop, my my crappy laptop, and these two things, and then I set up live. Or I have another. Uh, it's uh, it's like a Snowball, which is a different Yeti product. And I plug it into my uh, cam, my um, my iPhone, and I record. So both of those things are very, very cheap. I use a program called um, uh, God, what's it called? Um, it's it's uh, it's like an an a, a, a an MP3 recorder on my phone when I'm live. That the 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 little snowball thing cost me maybe like fifty dollars. And then I needed, uh, a, and, and it came with a cable. The, the, right now, the Blue Yeti is about 130, but I've seen it as low as like 80, and the pop filter was about 10 bucks. And uh, that is how I roll. Uh, and I've never gotten a complaint. Uh, mm -hmm. But 
um, I, I felt like when I went, like I want to take it to the next level. So like, I want to take it to the level where like, this sounds as good as like the best podcast, not just an acceptable podcast, but like the best podcasts that are out there. And um, Mark is one of the people who I met uh, at the show, at the show po uh, podcast evolution show, who uh, was very clear about the, the the gear that I should have if I can take it to the other level. In your defense, you weren't like just go burn that mic stuff that you just no. you just said like, well, that's that's, that's well, really like you should really get some better gear. Uh -huh. Like it was a very polite way of saying it. Um, but I'd love to know why you what I'm getting wrong about the Blue Yeti. Uh, and what you recommend instead. Wrong, wrong is a strong word. Like it's still, I mean, it still sounds good. It's sometimes it's about expanding the possibility space of what you can do um, or, or getting more for the money you spend, you know, like, um, so we do, um, so I'll speak specifically to field recording because that's most of the kinds of recording I do. So that's like doing interviews with people generally either on location or, you know, like where the location is kind of part of the story. Um, and I use a Zoom H6 recorder. Um, the reason I use, so it's a field recorder. It's used by, um, it's one of like two or three different kinds that a lot of public radio reporters use. Um, and I use it because it has an attachment for some built-in microphones. Um, I like to put a shotgun microphone attachment on it. Um, and then, uh, I can plug in a, I use a sure, these are all the, th the exact things I recommended to you. So, you know, that I, I wasn't pulling your chain. Um, it was a sure SM 57, which is one of a few, um, it's a microphone that doesn't, so mine is one of the cheaper end, um, handheld microphones, but it's like, if you've ever seen a TV reporter or a radio reporter, the microphone that they're holding up in their hand, actually, I could just show it to you. That's right. There it is. I'm talking on it right now. Awesome. Um, hopefully that I'm I'm doing exactly what I, I would hate a guest to do, which is play with their microphone. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so I take those two things out into the field to conduct interviews, but also to collect sound. So um, I did a field piece where I was recording an interviewer and um, our guest who is a B expert. Um, so with that same piece of equipment, I was able to do a sit down interview where I plugged two, two microphones like this one in and then had them on those microphones for their conversation. But then I was able to put the shotgun mic attachment on it, which if, if you're not familiar with different types of microphones, you don't have to be. It's more just about kind of learning what each of them do. I think the best way to think of a shotgun microphone is kind of like a telephoto lens for audio. Like it's highly directional. You can aim it at something far away and you get a very focused kind of burst. So I took that thing and basically shoved it right into the beehive. Like I got as close to the bees as I could possibly get. There's a ridiculous photo of me in a beekeeper outfit, but I was still wearing shorts. So I don't know how safe I was. <laughs> um, she was, the beekeeper was very confident though. She wasn't even wearing any protective gear. Um, but yeah, and I got a lot of really great sound to help that piece that made it a little bit more than just a conversation between two people. Um, and that's all with one piece of equipment. I mean, the recorder's like 400 bucks. I think it's, I saw uh, that. Uh, like you could get that, uh, the the recorder, plus like an SD card and a couple of other like accessory things that you might need for a little bit less than $400 on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even the microphones would not be essential, like not right away. But the reason I like that piece of gear and I recommend it to as many people as I can is just that like... When you have something, so like the setup you described, definitely any USB microphone is going to require a computer. Um, so it's probably, or, or uh, you know, like a secondary device that you're recording into. So like your phone. So like the phone, the phone is a, is a miracle piece of technology, the smartphone, because it, it really can stand in pretty well for a lot of different things. But just having that one recorder that you can plug a whole bunch of different kinds of microphones into that you you know is very reliable because is like if you're somebody who's creating stuff by yourself you want to know that something is going to work 100 percent of the time you you know if you're if there's a possibility every new piece of equipment you introduce is a failure point so if you have your phone and you have a microphone if your if your phone crashes or if the microphone goes sideways on you like your interview is gone right there that's and so that's a problem. 
Um, but if you have one of those field recorders, you, you can find ways to adapt, you know, like if your microphone stops working, you have one on the body and like, it, it kind of gives you more flexibility. Um, you can also plug that into your computer and then use it the same way that you're using your Yeti right now. So that's, you know, three possible, you know, I guess in, in the context of like, maybe if you were covering a convention, you could use it as a field recorder and you can get some sound of people kind of milling around or, or maybe like in an artist alley, you can get kind of people talking like some of that stuff that makes, makes a, like a produced piece, which, and our show is really different than this, just having a conversation, you know, like our show is about sometimes someone telling a story it's, you know, it's highly, highly edited. Somebody take an hour conversation might get edited down to like seven minutes. So like you need that stuff to draw the richness out of it. Um, and it takes a lot of time. I mean, like that's, that's something that I think you wouldn't, you should never think like, oh, well, all I, there's either the podcast where it's just two people talking on microphones or this American life. Like there's, there's a whole huge area that you can experiment with. And gear is all about giving you more tools to do that. You know, it's, it's like just opening up more possibilities. Yeah. And I actually was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago with my friends at Fanbase Press, and I noticed they used an H6 as their studio setup, but they also do field recording as well at shows. So it can do field, as you mentioned, and I watched it do uh, recordings as well uh, in studio. Yeah. And each one had its own little separate track and that they were playing with. And, uh, and you can actually, uh, instead of having to rely on the, uh, the, sound going into the mic uh, in, into the computer and then doing it in post you can actually control the volume the volume level like in the before it even gets to the computer and make sure that it all sounds good together well and the other thing is i didn't even yeah pointing out that it's a multi-track recorder too like um depending on how much editing you actually do like if you go into a program like pro tools is what we use um i think a lot more people probably use adobe audition because it's a little bit more available or even like reaper um you, you know like if everything is kind of compressed into one track it limits how much editing flexibility you have like you can't if if i on your recording am way louder than you for for whatever reason it might be hard for you to fix that if it's all recorded together but you could just adjust it in post um, if you have us all on separate tracks like that and having a piece of equipment that facilitates that for you, it's for one, it's one less thing that can go wrong. You know, it's going to give you that flexibility later. Um, but it also, you know, because it has the volume controls on the device, it's like kind of, you can kind of get like 80% of the way there automatically. And then the fine grain you have, like you're freeing up kind of mental space for like when you, instead of having to fix your audio, you're just improving it and enhancing it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, were I to do like a, a, a narrative show or a show like you're talking about, I certainly would want to to um, to uh, to invest in all of those things because um, you want to like have the best chance of succeeding and the best chance of having a um, of having the best audio quality of audio is the thing that you're going to drive the narrative forward. You need to have the best version of it. Yeah. So I will say this though, um, just because we're actually at a really interesting time for radio because about a week ago, um, probably a little before that we started getting emails from studios that were, cause that, so normally, so that's, that's like, if we're out in the field, that's one kind of interview you do, but kind of our stock and trade is um, we will tell, you know, like I'm interviewing an author next week and he was supposed to go to a studio in Minnesota, a public radio studio. And then our studio would connect with that one and we wouldn't be able to see each other, but there would be a direct connection. So it would be basically like the, the highest fidelity Skype call you've ever been on. Um, none of those studios are taking guests now. They're, they're all in social distancing mode. They are not even sure, you know, like our studios are not, we're not allowed to be there. Um, so all of that gear is now cut off and all of a sudden we have to get creative just like podcasters do, you know, like we have to figure out, well, with the, what we have available and what our guests have available, how can we get the best possible sound? And, you know, like the thing we keep going back to is like the voice memo app on an iPhone, the, the iPhone microphone is actually really good. So, you know, if you want to interview somebody and you're worried about how a Skype call is going to call going to sound like, you know, maybe you can tell them like, Hey, you know, 
call me on Skype and then record yourself using an iPhone. And, and then it's really about kind of controlling the situation, right? It's like, okay, well, if you put it on a stack of books and it's a few inches from your face and you try to do it at a desk so you're not moving too much, um, just email me the file after the interview and it will make you sound a hundred times better. And then it's kind of more about it, like communicating that with somebody that you're, you're trying to tell their story. So, I mean, like there's a gear component of it that's really important, but like ultimately this is about kind of best representing who you're talking to with what you have available. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. It's yeah. an interesting time to do, um, to, to, uh, to go about this. So, okay. So now we have the gear. There's also, I should mention that if you're going to do studio, um, there's also a roadcaster pro, which is kind of like the studio. It's, it's a, it's a bigger, and it looks more like a mixing board. It's not nearly as uh, as um, as handheld, but uh, I was told by multiple people that was like kind of the Mac Daddy thing. If you wanted to make sure that like you had the best like live, if you're going out to a location and let's say to do a live show or something, that like that's the one that you really, really, if you can get it, that's the one that you need. But it's like close to seven hundred dollars to get that one. Yeah. I mean, and that's the other thing is like you could add a mixing board to the H6 setup at some point if you were like, oh, I need the ability to like maybe I need eight microphones and there's only four ports on the on the Zoom. Um, the mixing board, maybe a cheaper mixing board would actually get you there, but then you have two pieces of equipment, so you have two points of failure. So you're always kind of playing that game of like, how complicated do I want my situation to be versus like what possibilities does it open up? Like the reason that thing is $700 is because it solves a lot of problems in one device. Like the more, the more one device can do for you, the more you're going to probably end up paying for it. Absolutely. And there's also, um, so there's also a difference between the kinds of mics that you want in studio and live is what I heard. I heard that if you want, uh, this goes above my pay grade for this thing, but like that you want a dynamic mic if you are in studio more and you want uh, uh, a different kind of mic if you're in the field or vice versa. Is yeah. that accurate? Yeah, that's correct. It looks like a, I think a cardioid pattern mm -hmm. is usually what you want in the field. Um, a lot of that comes down to um, pickup uh, in terms of like uh, like a cardioid microphone. I could be interviewing you in a really, really, really noisy crowd. And as long as I had it like right up in your mouth, uh, like you, like in your face, like it, it wouldn't, it, it would still be like, it wouldn't get blown out the way that uh, different kinds of microphones, like a, a, a performance microphone, a dynamic microphone is an even narrower pickup pattern, um, but it's kind of a flatter sound. So like basically the more sensitive a microphone is, the more background sound it's going to pick up, but the richer the main sound it picks up will be. So like in studio, um, condenser microphones are, are really nice, um, but they are, they require, like if I had a condenser microphone in this room, you would definitely hear the fact that I have like heat coming on every once in a while. And you'd probably hear echo in the room. Like that's the kind of microphone that you in the studio that's got like all the eggshell soundproofing all around it. Like that's the kind of microphone you'd probably see there. Um, some of that's also about consistency. Like we have a specific microphone that the host of our show records everything on and pretty much we'll, we'll put it in the field. We'll put it in her home. And then it's just about listening to, okay, is this in this context, does this microphone sound good? Like, does it sound the way that it's supposed to? So like a lot of that, again, it's not about necessarily having the right microphone, but having a microphone that you understand the limitations and the trade-offs of. Absolutely. I think a dog right. was trying to get in my office. That's okay. My dog tries to do the same thing. So um, we talked about gear. I, I would be remiss if I, didn't, uh, if I didn't ask you, once you have the gear, so you've got the gear now, um, the next thing you're probably going to have to deal with, or like the last real thing, we're going to take editing off the table because we're nearing our hour. We're nearing our hour together, but I do want to talk about interviewing guests because you're probably going to either be interviewing guests or having a co-host. Generally, is how most of these podcasts work. Not saying that you won't have one that's just you talking into the mic, but that seems to be the least common form of podcast that I 
that I, uh, especially in this world where we're seeking connection, uh, this is kind of the theme of this podcast episode. I'm going to keep it to like you want to connect with either co-hosts or you want to connect with um with with uh with someone you're interviewing and mm -hmm. specifically uh, interviewing. Do you have any tips for? For, for conducting interviews, making the, the person feel comfortable and getting what you want? Sure. Um, well, the, th there's a few things. I mean, like some of them are resource-based. Like if you can have somebody helping you out with recording, if that's a possibility, that's going to free up brain space for you to just connect with your guests. Since most of the time when I've been podcasting, that's not always an option. The next best thing is just to have a setup, like really, really know, like, I know how my recorder works. I went to the place where I'm recording it, or you know, like I I know my setup at home really well. Like basically, that you try to eliminate as many unknowns as possible, and just really know what to expect, so that when you have your time with your guest, you're really really just focused on them. Um, something similar, and this is something in my former before I got into audio, I was a print journalist, and you know, like I would write my questions as like a here is a series of pieces of information I'm interested about, or you know, like. I know, like, you know, like I can get a decent soundbite out of their answer to these questions, but you know, like most of the time it's like, here's a list of questions I want the answers to with no, there's some through line between them, but not necessarily a ton. It's kind of like, let's get the info dump out of this person while I have their time. Um, the first time I tried to do that for a radio interview, the producer, the senior producer who I was working with was just like, no person would have a conversation like this. Like you would not just shout a bunch of questions at somebody and not acknowledge, you know, like the worst sin you can do is like you ask someone a really deep, thoughtful question and they start answering like humanly to you. And then you look down at your notes and you're like looking at your next question. And like there is always a degree of this plate spinning act when you're a really good interviewer of like, well, you have to be thinking about what you want to ask next, but you have to think about it more in the context of the conversation that you're having. You know, you, you have to stay present for the person that you want to connect with, because that's what's going to make them feel comfortable revealing things that maybe they wouldn't normally talk about. I mean, like we we interview a lot of authors and there's this like we have like some of the best interviewers who do this kind of work on our show. And like they they can really break people out of the like, here are the five things I tell everyone about this book that I'm talking to, you know, like they they will say like, like they will have done their homework and know like, hey, Phil Pullman, like you're interested in this idea of panpsychism. What is that about? You know, like, like having done like ha doing your homework so you can keep the gears turning, not doing your homework so you can prove that you did your homework if that makes sense. Like, that's really what will take you far. Like, it's kind of like how you would never, you know, you'd want to at least if you were going to meet someone for coffee, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't just show up and then not know anything about that person. Or, you know, you would try to be like, let's, let's kind of like start where we're, we're both at and we can kind of go, you know, you wouldn't say like, the first question you'd say would not be like, oh, I heard, you know, like this thing happened to you on Facebook. What's up with that? You know, like you would you would ease into that kind of thing. Absolutely. That sounds great. I actually have uh, you can't see it when you're listening to this podcast, but like I have a list of this is just my list of all the questions right. that I wanted to ask. It's not but really actually, that. But and that's I think you, you're doing it perfectly right, which is that it's just a bunch of words like it's just to remind you where you want to go. You know, like I would write fully formed questions, which is like that, that made me a really stilted interviewer when I first tried to do it on the air, you know, but having that thing of like, here are the things I know I want to cover. Like, I think that's, that's part of really doing your homework. Yeah. I thought of, uh, like, a like a mind cloud or like a brain or whatever they, I think it's called the mind cloud. I don't do like, I don't do like the corporate work, but I think they call it like a mind cloud or a brain cloud where you just put the words that you want to, that you like associate with this person that you, and I always for me, I always try to uh, talk to people who I've met before or talked to before so that like I don't have to do so much work. We've already had like that conversation. I just have to go and look up some information on them, read a couple of articles on them and then remember like what I wanted to talk about. Because usually what happens is uh, I, I would assume this what happens with everybody who interviews from what I talk to, but you know, you listen to somebody or you meet somebody or you talk to somebody and you go, wow, that would be a really interesting conversation to have on 
the show or yeah. that person would. So you're probably already have a trigger of like, why, even if you're just cold emailing somebody like why you're cold emailing them. Uh, it's not, it could just be because like they're a famous author, but like still that would give you some sense of where you wanted the show to go. Mm -hmm. But I found that the more, the longer that I did the show, like the better I got at like knowing what the people were wanted. Cause I would talk to the people long enough and I would talk to my fans for long enough that they would like kind of, they would tell me what their favorite interviews were. Mm -hmm. And then I would be like, Oh, I should like, they really like it when I get deep on these sorts of topics. But when you're first starting out, that's not going to be a, a thing that you like have access to the, uh, so I always just like to to find interesting people in my own life or that are doing the thing that I like to do or um, usually people that I've met at a show or, or listened to on a podcast or met at a party uh, who do something interesting and say, that would be like a really good interview. And then I then they're they're kind of already broken down a little bit. Like it's not like that first moment is. Right. And I will say that like even having the, the video, uh, I was skeptical of having the video but i can say that like having the video really does help like break down the barrier that you normally get from audio mm -hmm. uh in a very real way the, the the times that i've used it yeah i that's something i think is really interesting that's kind of changing because like you know most of the old school producers i work with um like they didn't have that option and they've kind of developed this really authoritative voice of like this way of connecting to people as a voice as a disembodied voice and so now if they have the video option you know it's open but like they they their style will change like they you know we do sometimes on stage interviews or you know like i think it does make them a little bit more present you know like they aren't kind of going deep into their research in their head while they're like the disembodied public radio voice they're like really really staying with the story that somebody is sharing um, which leads to these really intimate moments, you know, and so it's cool that that can be mediated in a way that's that's not that doesn't require us being on a stage together. You know, it sounds so simple because it's like, oh, yeah, of course, video would make it seem more personal. But like you you can't really overestimate how much of an impact that has on how you're going to connect with somebody. And I, and you always say, uh, yeah, it's it's helpful. But like, how helpful is it? I think it's like it's also, well, how much better is it to have video than that? How much better is it to have an H6 than to have a Yeti? Like, what is the what is the gulf between those two things? And um, uh, and hi, Rai. Uh, thanks for thanks for thanks for listening on Twitch. I um I can say that when I do the uh, without the video, I am constantly like looking for other things to do. Like, mm -hmm. like, like when they're listening, I'm preparing for the next question or I'm like trying to listen to, or like the phone will vibrate or like that. But when you're doing it on video, you can't, you don't have that option because yeah. like everybody can see what you're doing, including the guest, and like just going over to your phone and scrolling through is like super rude. So you, and even if it's not super rude, it will be perceived as super rude. So you end up like being in this bubble. And I'm very, I'm very in, like the reason I brought this show back was so I could have interesting conversations with people I wanted to talk to and anything I can do to be more present in that moment, I think helps the interview. Um, and hopefully it helps the people that are at home listening as well. And it helps you if you're planning to do a podcast or a radio show or something like that. This is a very simple, dumb thing, but like we actually just have a little post-it that we put up in the studio that just says, look here. And then that's so like when you don't have the video, it's like that's here's it's almost like a meditation, right? It's like I'm going to meditate on that spot so I can really because anything you're touching or putting into your brain is really taking you out of the moment. And like, you know, some people have this great skill where they can kind of snap to something else and then snap right back into the conversation. Uh, I find that that's a little bit rare. Most people don't really think that way, you know, like they they it's easy to get knocked out of having that connection with somebody. And like, if you're really getting into it and getting deep on something, that's, that's the perfect way to lose it. So you want to stay present. As well. Absolutely. All right. So let us, we're nearing the end of our hour. 
and I wanted to move to your show that you produce. And because we're all in this time, I assume when this goes live in a couple of weeks, we're still going to be on lockdown. And so we're all looking for more media to consume and more things to hopefully take our mind off of this and, and give us a, uh, 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 new experiences. So why don't you uh, take us through your show and tell us what uh, what what it is it's about? Sure. Um, so I produce, I am a producer on two different public radio podcasts. Um, one is the main show. Uh, it's called To the Best of Our Knowledge. Um, it's been a public radio program since like 1990, I think. Um, and it's been a podcast since at least 2001. So they've been doing it for a long time. Um, and uh, the thing I really love about it is it's it's really just a show about curiosity. Um, our, like we're a public radio show that puts the world through a kaleidoscope of ideas is the way we like to put it. So like you might uh, have a show about bees that's talking about bees in terms of like a local ecosystem type story and like somebody who's like why we need to nurture bees in our local environment. Um, you might have somebody who then talks about like the psychology and um, like hive behavior of bees, but then also like the economic impact of like, what does it mean if people can have a, a beehive that they maintain in like inner city Detroit? Um, we've had shows about uh, psychedelic experiences and how they can uh, either open your mind in, in like creative ways, but also like maybe as a possible treatment for depression. Um, We've had shows about socialism, shows about, we're working on a, sh a show about skin and skin care. Um, so it, it kind of just runs the total gamut, but um, the, the overwhelming theme is going deep on a specific topic. Um, so that's every week um, on possibly your public radio station, but also our website at ttbook.org. Um, the second podcast is kind of a spinoff called Bookmarks. Um, which is at the end of a lot of those interviews, we will just ask an author like, hey, can you tell a story, just a short story about how a book just profoundly changed your life or like just something like a book that really, really left an impact on you. Um, and it's a great way to kind of knock someone off of their feet a little bit because the people who like great, great, great writers, especially tend to be really, really great readers. Um, they, they have books that you would not have, you wouldn't, they, they've affected people in ways that you maybe wouldn't expect. Um, so they're, they're usually like three minute episodes. Um, our most recent season, the first episode is with Philip Pullman, who wrote the um, His Dark Materials series. Um, but his book is, I don't, I hate, it's three minutes, so it's not really like I'm spoiling it, but his book is just a pocket atlas. Like it's not like an authored book. But, but the reason is because when he was a kid, he would like basically chart he was kind of a military brat and mm -hmm. um, he would kind of use it to kind of orient where he's been in, in the world. And uh, then later on when he was actually working on dark material series, like he would, like he still has a, uh, like an Atlas that he pulls out and lays out and like, he kind of models fictional locations on real world locations. So it, it, it's this, this kind of creative tool that he, he kind of started leaning on at an early age, but like, it's not even a book you would think about as a book you would read, but, but it's just it's really interesting to hear how it affected him so so we have um i think there's 13 episodes of that up right now and then we'll, we'll have another 13 coming out in the coming weeks so now listen to a couple of them they were i really liked i really like that one uh because i cool. i did not know what to expect i so it was just like your favorite author talking about a book that influenced them for a couple of minutes and it, like it kind of it, like it got to me a couple of times it was great yeah yeah, no, they're 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 cool. I, they're they're fun. They're really short. Um, they're great for heavy podcast listeners. <laughs> mm -hmm. they're, they're just another three minutes. We don't want to take too much of your time, but but it's nice to go deep on something. You know, the author is doing all the talking. We don't have any interviewers on the show um, other than our, our host and Strange Champs is kind of telling you who they are and, and kind of kind of setting you on the chart with their story. But other than that, it's just kind of the author sharing what they have to share. Um, but you can learn, you can find all that stuff at it's ttbook.org slash bookmarks, all the info for that one. Awesome. Uh, well, it was great having you on. I'm going to use the question I use to, uh, to end every podcast, uh, which is uh, tell us uh, the best piece of advice that you've ever gotten for uh, building your creative career. 
And uh, could be something you talked about already, could be uh, something brand new. Uh, and then where we can find you specifically, if you have a uh, 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 social media presence, and then we'll say goodbye. Sure. Um, I think the best, uh, the best advice I got was when I first got into radio. Um, but I think it kind of applies to anything creative you want to do, which was just book it, just book it. Like it's, you know, uh, I would get in my head about like, oh, well, we can't interview. Like at the time I really wanted to do a show with Zoe Quinn, um, who is at the center of Gamergate and, uh, that I, I I just, you know, like given my interest in digital spaces, like she had a really traumatic experience in a bunch of different digital spaces. And that was, that was the thing I wanted to talk about. And, you know, he, uh, this particular producer, um, he was really like, you know what, you, you should just go for it. Like you, you, like sometimes you talk to somebody, it's okay for an idea to not be fully formed is kind of the point. Like mm. if you can, if you're if you really feel like in your gut like okay there's something here this is it's exciting it feels deep i'm curious to learn more about it like that's a really good sign and you should follow that instinct and be true to it and don't necessarily feel like something has to be perfect before you're going to pursue it and go like and try to produce something interesting for the world you know and and if you put it out and it's not perfect that's fine i mean it's like you you just have to be able to look at it with a really clear eye and say like, well, what, what about this was I really happy with and what about it could go better next time? And, and that's really the only way to create anything worthwhile is that you have to like go for it. You have to book it. You have to like use the microphone you have on your desk. And then next time, you know, just tweak what you feel like you need to tweak. Awesome. I love it. Is there a place that people could find you specifically if they uh, want to connect with you? Sure. So probably I am on Twitter entirely too much um uh at mark on fire um and then i'm i'm running all the social accounts for the show so we're at tt book on twitter instagram um yeah and then ttbook.org is where the show is so awesome wonderful it was so nice to have you on mark thank you so much thanks for having me this was great and now I'm going to see if I can somehow end this broadcast without uh, destroying this connection uh, so, I can, so I can just say goodbye. But we'll see. Maybe I'll be saying goodbye to you forever or, or for, for the thing. Or maybe I'll be able to keep you on the air or t in like the back end. Hang Hopefully. on a second. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, uh.